And according to my watch, it is exactly 9.30. Very warm welcome this morning to the seventh edition of On the Agenda, a web series by the European Liberal Forum, the Political Foundation and Think Tank of the ALDE Party. I have the big pleasure of welcoming you this morning on a, well, on the one hand, very interesting, and on the other hand, a very sad topic, which is Brexit. Um, and we seem to be going from the land of broken dreams when it comes to European integration to the land of broken promises, um, looking at the developments in, uh, in the issue of Brexit that are upcoming, especially with the talks that are upcoming uh, in the next month, and especially looking at the end of the transition period um, that is also upcoming. Um, before I hand over to our dear moderator and friend Peter Müller, head of the office of the Spiegel in Brussels, um, I just want to use my time in the beginning um, as a little advertisement block, and that is for our regular column, which is called London Calling, a regular view on what is happening on the islands um, across the channel, um, written and edited by our dear Irina von Wiese, who is also in the call with us here today. So if you haven't seen it, if you haven't read it, I highly recommend you to do so. It's a bi-weekly column for what is happening on the islands in view of the European affairs and the future of EU and British relationship. Um, without any further ado, I would like to hand over to Peter Müller, our maestro when it comes to these kind of events. Peter, thank you very much for being with us. Dear speakers, thank you very much for being with us this morning. And Peter, over to you. Thanks, Daniel, for your kind words to start off, to kickstart our seminar on Brexit. I'm Peter Müller, the EU correspondent for Der Spiegel here in Brussels. And like so many of my colleagues, I have been following Brexit basically for more than four years now, um, since the referendum outcome, which back then in 2016 surprised almost all of us here in Brussels and um, has kept us in good work when following summits and um, all the details and negotiations with Mr. Barnier and his different counterparts from the UK. Today, it couldn't be a more timely day for our discussion on Brexit with the European Liberal Forum because it's Brexit Day once again. Brexit Day in the sense that um, heads of states and government will meet um, this afternoon at three o'clock in, um, in the European quarter here in Brussels. And um, contrary to the last couple of months, um, when they've been discussing many of the issues we, saw, we have also been discussing in our series here with the Real Liberal Forum, nowadays, today, it's Brexit they are discussing. And in my view, um, the expectations on this summit this afternoon couldn't be, once again, one might say, more different when you look at it from the UK side and when you look at it from the EU side. So Boris Johnson had made clear that this very day, the 15th of October, is the make or, make or break day. If there's no deal tonight, then um, there is no deal for the future relationship between um, the European Union and the UK. The European side, of course, sees this totally differently. And if I might say so, a bit biased from what I hear when talking to um, people taking part in the meeting this afternoon, maybe a bit more realistically, European leaders think they are nowhere even close to a deal. Of course, the big topics are um, um, well known to everybody of our panelists and our viewers, um, and we will come to them. It seems that to this afternoon, we will more have kind of a stock taking exercise with the leaders um, in the European quarter here in Brussels, find out what the red lines are for a deal and um, when a deal from the EU side of the story doesn't make any sense anymore. Of course, everybody's saying this and it's true, the clock is ticking. We only have till the end of this year to come up with some kind of trade deal on the future um, relationship and this makes things even more interesting. So this is why I'm quite happy to um, be able to moderate this panel. Before I hand over to our first panelist, <clears throat> I just want to remind our viewers and listeners that the whole thing is recorded. You can watch it later on on the um, Liberal Forum's Facebook site, but um, you can also, and this is maybe more important now, join our debates. So um, you all know this by now, 
um, in our confinement, from our confinement in Corona times, there is a little um, piece on the bottom of your screen where it says questions and answers Q and A. And please um, feel free to join our conversations, write me questions um, via this, um, this little thing, and I will be sure to forward them to our distinguished panelists. So without further ado, I come to our first panelist. I'm happy that um, Irina von Wiese joins us from the UK. Irina has been a uh, European parliamentarian for the Liberal Democrats. She was with the Renew Europe um, group in the European Parliament, starting from the last European um, elections until Brexit Day at the end of January. Irina is a lawyer by training and um, full disclosure here, she has taken part in a program I also took part a couple of years later at the Harvard Kennedy School. So she was a McCloy scholar over there studying public administrations. And this is why we also um, from time to time when Irina was in Brussels had a chat over a cup of coffee or a pint of beer. Irina, um, people tend to forget when discussing what's happening today in the next months. And I see this also with us journalists that Brexit actually already happened. The UK, nobody feels it at the moment because we are in a transition period, but the UK is already left, has already left the EU at the end of January. So um, what's your feeling how the situation is in Great Britain at the moment? How is Great Britain looking at the summit, which will start this afternoon? Irina. Thank you very much, Peter, and a very uh, good morning from an unusually sunny London. Um, I don't know whether that is in any way reflecting on the prospects of today's negotiations, but um, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. I feel a bit like one of those dinosaurs in Jurassic Park in that my species, the UK MEP, is extinct, but I'm still very much alive and I'm grateful to Steven Spielberg to give me a new platform to speak from, I gather. Um, so where are we? Well, Firstly, I wanted to give you a sort of very brief overview over where we are and how on earth we got into this situation. Um, and then I'd like to speak a little bit about the political implications. And I should add that although um, I did indeed represent Liberal Democrats, what I would say today are my own views, um, not necessarily that of my party or my former political group. And um, certainly um, not representative of the um, UK government in any sense. Um, so Brexit done or not done? Well, in December last year, Boris Johnson won the general election telling everybody that he would get Brexit done. And indeed, we have left uh, the European Union on the 31st of January, which is why I lost my job on the 31st of January. Um, but we have not really left anything apart from the institutions because of the transition period, which of course extended European Union rights until the end of this year. So many people here in Britain haven't really felt a direct impact on their daily lives. Of course, they have felt a very um, much more acute direct impact on their daily lives with the pandemic. And this has kind of overshadowed uh, Brexit and many people have, think it is indeed now done. Of course we all know that it is far from it and that really the crunch time will come after the transition period and very much will depend on the outcome of the next few days and weeks of negotiations. I'm not going to go into detail about those negotiations, we will have a chance to talk about this later. But what I would want to talk about is the sort of political implications those that have already happened as a result of our departure um, from the political institutions and those that are likely to happen in the event, in the unfortunately likely event, that we will have either no deal at all with the EU or maybe a very skeletal deal um, with just a few sort of specific agreements on, on specific items, but no overall comprehensive trade agreement. So what has already happened? Well, firstly, there are a number of geopolitical implications. 
And I think there the most important one is the significant weakening of the EU and its standing in the world um, through the departure of the UK. The first time, of course, as a member state has left. Where does this, where does this leave the EU? And how, what has that done to um, the, the view that third countries have of the EU as one of the big economic and political powers in the world? And this is, I believe all of these are open questions, by the way, because there is no immediate answer and I hope we will get a chance to, to discuss this. Secondly, there is the internal balance within the EU. And having sat in the European Parliament for seven months, I could see very well that um, Britain with all its um, sort of disruptive influence uh, in the EU also had um, a kind of balancing role a balancing role between the big EU powers, which are Germany and France. And with the departure of those 73 MEPs uh, from the European Parliament, this balance has kind of gone out of kilter and it remains to be seen how it will be rebalanced. Thirdly, of course, there is the future of the Union, not the European one, but ours, the United Kingdom. And a lot has been said about this. I'm not going to repeat it, but of course, um, now we are at a stage where the Scottish independence um, movement and the Scottish independence party um, has called for another referendum on independence fueled by the overwhelming majority of anti-Brexit voters in Scotland. And there is now a much greater chance that the SNP will be able to use uh, Brexit and its economic and political consequences as a good excuse to um, renew its drive for Scottish independence. And the question is, where will that leave the rest of the Union? And then, of course, there's the problem of Northern Ireland, which, as we know at the moment, is still politically part of um, the United Kingdom. But should the withdrawal agreement be implemented as envisaged, Big question. It would de facto economically remain part of the European Union. And this is a politically very difficult situation. And the question is when, if it does come to a crunch, where would Northern Ireland really sit? So a lot of open questions that have already been asked and um, as a consequence of uh, the departure on the 31st of January. One more that I should probably mention, um, because I was um, vice chair of the Human Rights Subcommittee in, in the European Parliament, is the effect on human rights. And I don't mean just the rights of EU citizens in the UK, which are also precarious, but I mean human rights of people around the globe, and in particular in those countries where the, where the, EU, the United Kingdom traditionally has played an important role, the Commonwealth countries. So, when I was in Parliament, um, I was invited on a mission, for example, to um, Kashmir, the Pakistani part of, of Kashmir, where we saw a lot of human rights defenders and a lot of victims of human rights abuses who were looking to the UK MEPs to represent them, to speak up for them, because the UK was the country they had the closest link to. And of course, there is a huge diaspora um, of Commonwealth citizens from all over the world in the UK. And traditionally, UK MEPs have spoken up for these people, and now they have lost their platform, a platform which, of course, is much more powerful in the heart of the EU than it is as an individual country. So lots of things that I think have already happened that maybe we haven't quite noticed because of the pandemic. Then there are the likely effects of the future no deal or bad deal situation that we are facing from the 31st of January. And I would like again to focus on political implications and leave the more nitty gritty economic implications to my co-panelists who will speak uh, much more aptly on this. Further geopolitical implications. This of course is important and it is linked to the economic consequences and in particular the dependency 
of the Johnson government on other third countries as a consequence of losing um, his biggest trading partner, the EU. There really isn't very much choice that Johnson now has because, well, a comprehensive sort of dependency on China, arguably we already have a very high dependency um, on China, as of course have other EU member states, notably Germany. But that seems politically a lot less palatable than a close relationship with the United States. Now, as we all know, um, the topic of chlorinated US chicken has um, really kept a lot of people um, very skeptical about these prospects and, and how the UK will manage the relationship with the US, but also the relationship with other potential big trading partners when it has lost its biggest and most important trading partner, at least for the foreseeable future. Then there is the sore topic of the rule of law. Now, for me as an opposition politician, um, and I think for many people in the UK, also for me as a lawyer, what has happened in September of this year was really quite shocking. Because what has happened is that for the first time, a democratically elected government in Western Europe has really um, moved away from the principle of the rule of law by enacting or proposing a law, the so-called Internal Markets Bill, which by their own admission will infringe an international binding agreement, which is the Withdrawal Agreement, which of course was signed and then pushed through Parliament by Boris Johnson in three days because he thought it was such a fantastic solution. And of course, because this is what rescued him the December general elections. And now suddenly, this very same agreement that he was so keen on signing is just being pushed aside because of a, a, a difficulty, a conundrum, which was clear from the very beginning. And that is the conundrum of Northern Ireland and the border between the North and the Republic of Ireland. Suddenly it occurred to this government that they could not have both unity and an internal market in the United Kingdom and the abolition of borders between Northern Ireland and the Republic, which of course in and of itself is enshrined in the Good Friday Agreement. Now the Good Friday Agreement is what underpins peace in Ireland. And we must not forget that the United States as a signatory also has a stake in this. So by breaching or by proposing to have a law in the United Kingdom, which will, if enacted, breach the withdrawal agreement, the Northern Ireland Protocol of the Withdrawal Agreement, but may in its consequences also breach the Good Friday Agreement has repercussions around the globe. Firstly, the United States, at least the Democrats, have already indicated that they will not have a comprehensive trade agreement with a country that is willing to breach the Good Friday Agreement. Secondly, what does that do to the United Kingdom's standing in the world? What does that do to our reputation? And what does that do to our trustworthiness around the globe? Are we really going to be standing up for the rule of law in other countries? Are we really going to be able to fight for human rights around the globe if we are perfectly prepared to breach an international agreement? So I think we really cannot underestimate the damage that has already been done. And even if the Internal Markets Bill is not going to pass, particularly the House of Lords, it may be delayed now, but even if it will not pass, I think this damage has unfortunately already been done. Okay. So there are other non-economic consequences. We could look at, for example, um, a no deal Brexit. What does it mean for security? What does it mean for law enforcement, education and research? These are all specific topics. I think we ran out of time. So I would propose that we can talk about any of these topics later in this discussion. I will leave but it at that with a lot of open questions.
No, that was actually a lot of food for thought. Um, thanks very much for this, Irina, and for this overview from London. Um, with this, I want to turn our discussion and give the floor to Tom Parker. Tom Parker is the president of the British Chamber of Commerce in Belgium. He's a very experienced communications expert, has been in the business for two decades. And of course, he is our man for the business side today in our discussion. Tom, um, when you talk to, to the people in Brussels, the people, the so-called people in the know, there seems to be a kind of consensus emerging now at this um, end game towards the, the negotiations on the future relationship that in the end of the day, if we don't have any deal, maybe this is better than agreeing to a bad deal in the end. What's your point of view on this? What does the British business community say to this? Or maybe you also know, of course, what your European counter counterparts feel when this um, point is being raised. Tom, the floor is yours. Good morning, Peter. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for the opportunity to speak today. That's a really good question. And of course, you know, in many respects, particularly from the EU 27 side is the key question when it comes to their troublesome neighbor. Um, you know, from my personal position, and this is really not the position of the chamber, I should emphasize, is that you can really understand why, you know, there is this point that maybe, um, you know, no deal is better than a bad deal. Clearly, there is a, a consideration which is economic. The consequences of a no deal Brexit are enormous. And just to put this in context, the uh, Bank of England made a calculation that it's four times greater than the impact of COVID on the UK economy. So we're talking about in the no deal situation, an 8% drop of GDP. So it, it, it's huge. Um, but I think EU leaders need to look at this, not just within the context of the economics, but also within the context of the message that it delivers to, to existing member states and other member states. You know, um, a bad deal can potentially create the wrong precedents. And I think with a, a longer term perspective, one needs to keep this very much in mind. That being said, you know, we as the British Chamber of Commerce are very strongly advocating for a deal. Um, you know, we are an organization that represents over a hundred companies, big and small. Um, we all have a common interest in the UK EU economy, but we're not UK PLC. So amongst our membership, we have companies like BMW, we have companies like Siemens, uh, Novartis and others. Um, and, you know, we think that a deal is important, not just because it will provide some comfort to some of our members and some parts of the economy. Um, you see that if you compare an, a no deal situation to a deal situation, even though the deal is likely to be thin, uh, that the, the, uh, the benefit of that is a reduced impact whereby you only have a, a loss of about 3.5% of GDP in the UK. Now that of course extrapolates over to the EU side, it's a little less on the EU side, but nonetheless, it's not insignificant. But perhaps most importantly for us is that we hope that the deal not only provides, you know, it, it mitigates some of that impact, but also that it's a starting point for further negotiation, that actually from it, then you can start to build in future agreements on other things. And to our mind, this is extremely important because let's face it, if there is a deal, you know, the deal is only going to cover parts of, uh, the, of the economy and, and, part, and certain sectors. You know, goods, yes, they'll be covered but services will be in all likelihood more or less completely left out. And this is dramatic, uh, particularly on the UK side, but I, you know, arguably for everybody, because in today's economy, you cannot distinguish between goods and services. You know, when, when you look at a company today, um, you know, they may be providing a, a good, let's say Rolls Royce is providing an engine, but actually it's all the after service, which is the real part of, of their business where they make most money. 
So, so this is something that for all sides of the negotiation is really, really important. And this platform for us is absolutely critical. Um, you know, I think what's important to note, uh, you know, is if there is a no deal, we're really concerned that there is not only the economic impact, but potentially a downward spiral in, in trust and in confidence in each other. And we think that this is going to be extremely damaging for the European con economy, not just the EU one, not just the UK, but the European economy and the global economy at large, which is, which is bad for business and it's bad for citizens. And, you know, we think it's unfortunate that you know, the negotiations are at a point where there is, um, you know, a, a, a lack of confidence, um, which has been triggered by certain recent events. I don't think I need to labor the point too much. But I think it's fair to say that the business community likes predictability. We like stability. And all of this is underpinned by the rule of law. Um, and the rule of law is absolutely critical to do good business. So, you know, that's, I think, a, an important message. In terms of the chamber, you know, we are still working to, to both scenarios. So we are, you know, planning for a deal. We are planning for no deal. Um, I think suffice to say, whether it's a deal or a no deal, the 1st of January is going to be messy because, you know, even if there is a deal, the UK will no longer be part of the customs union. It will be no longer part of the single market. And there will be consequences to this. And I think this is something which, you know, as part of the, the strategy, um, you know, there was this hope that by the transition agreement, we would provide some comfort. Um, and people wouldn't realize that actually the real date of Brexit in some respects is the 1st of January, 2021. Um, and, and, you know, this is going to be a major challenge for businesses of all sizes. Of course, the bigger ones have the means to invest in, to support and cope. So it's really going to be the small businesses that unfortunately absorb most of the impact. But, you know, we hope that, as I said, that, that a deal will uh, be a starting point for, for building to a, a stronger collaboration. Um, it's important though to recognize that, as I said, certain uh, parts of the economy will be left out. The consequences of not being part of the customs union and the single market. And also that some really important issues, you know, some of the granularity of, of what will change is just being missed at the moment. A really good example that I was talking about earlier in the week um, is the, the issue around the recognition and enforcement of cross-border commercial and civil judgments, which impact business in a big, big way. Um, actually, it impacts all our citizens in a big, big way. But at the moment, there's a real risk that this isn't addressed. So, uh, you know, it, it's it's a really, really, uh, you know, key moment. And the British Chamber, as I said, is strongly advocating for a deal. You may have noticed that actually yesterday there was a statement from the BDI, from Medef, and from Confindustria arguing for a deal. They made a statement yesterday afternoon. The business community wants this deal. We have a, a role to play um, in, in keeping up, you know, the partnership between yeah. the UK and its European friends. And we're determined to do that, but we think that deal is really important as a, as a starting point. I leave it Thanks, at that, Peter. Peter. Thanks, Tom. That was really interesting and also good to have your view from um, the business community on what's happening in the next months and, and, of course, thereafter, after the new, in a way, Brexit day at the end of the year. Um, over to Nikolai. Um, von Andasa. Nikolai, you're the head of the research division at the Stiftung für Wissenschaft und Politik, which is one of the big foreign policy think tanks in Germany. You've been a lecturer at various distinguished universities, the Viadrina in Frankfurt um, at the Oder among them. I'm also happy to have you here, of course, because you're Mr. Brexit also uh, from time to time from my publication, Der Spiegel, and have been publishing at our webpage your thoughts on Brexit. Um, you're, of course, joining us, Nikolai, from Berlin. And um, we were lucky that we have a few from London. We had a few from Brussels now. Now let's turn to Berlin and let me ask you this, Nikolai. 
if you talk to people, um, it still seems that the British side and, of course, Prime Minister Boris Johnson still hope that if negotiations don't go anywhere, there will be the Germans to rescue. Or at least Angela Merkel, who, of course, in her, is in her last year as a chancellor. She um, has the German presidency in the EU at the moment. Doesn't want to tarnish her European legacy with having a no deal Brexit now at the end of the year. What's your take on that, Nikolai? How much of a help will the Germans be in these final stretches of the negotiations? Yeah, thank you very much for the kind introduction uh, and a very, a very good uh, question. Uh, good morning from Berlin. Uh, maybe unlike the stereotype, it's raining here in Berlin and the sun is shining in London. And that's maybe a, a good metaphor for how people are looking on the Brexit deal. Uh, you get a lot of positive briefings uh, from, uh, to, I think, British press over the state of the Brexit talks. But here people are much more reserved. Um, and there's no expectation that Angela Merkel will come and ride like the white knight and rescue uh, the Brexit talks uh, for the UK, quite the contrary. Um, I think uh, what's clear here in Berlin is that um, even though we now have the German EU Council presidency, Germany wants this to be an EU-UK negotiations. Uh, so there's not going to be a strong bilateral push between bi Angela Merkel and Boris Johnson. Uh, and uh, the German government has made very clear that it's very supportive of Barnier and wants to go uh, through this process via the EU institutions and no direct bilateral negotiations between London and Berlin uh, or London and Paris to solve these issues. I think secondly, um, here people um, have been really angry about the internal market bill. Irina already outlined uh, the issues and Germans, I think, perceive European integration often through the prism of law. Um, and this principle of Pacta sunt servanda, uh, treaties are to be kept, is really strongly enrooted in the German view about European integration and international politics. And so this idea that the UK would just go and violate its commitments uh, in a treaty that it has just signed eight, eight months ago um, has really strong repercussions here and has really damaged the trust. Um, the interpretation of the German government, I think, and by the EU in large, is that this was primarily meant as a provocation towards the Europeans but a, a provocation that uh, was out of bounds and was a step too far. And if trust has to be rebuilt and if there has, is the possibility for a free trade agreement, that can only come with the UK government withdrawing the contentious pieces um, of that bill before it comes to law in order to at least rebuild part of, of that trust. Um, and then finally, I think uh, it's also clear that uh, the German uh, industries, and Tom just outlined the statements of the BDI and other European industries, is very much behind the approach of the EU overall in saying uh, that, yes, we are interested in a deal for, from the perspective of German industries, but we want a deal that protects the level playing field, that has a governance system with robust uh, dispute settlement, uh, so that we don't have a competitor at our doorstep, which can undercut our standards, but still get a very good access to the internal market. Um, and therefore, I think, um, unlike the, the myth of the German car makers in the UK, Germany has, throughout this whole process, very much supported the EU institutions, very strongly supported Ireland, in particularly, uh, particular, and I think we'll continue to push uh, for a deal, yes, but uh, for a deal within the EU's interest. And this brings me to my, my second point. Um, I think when we're interpreting the state of play in Brexit, it's always important to look at the choreography um, of events. And I think it's, it's very clear that while the EU position has been quite stable, uh, there has been a lot of flux in messaging from the UK. And I think if we look just at the last uh, three months, um, August and September, all the messaging from London that we got here in Berlin was, we are serious about no deal, we're implementing the internal market bill, Boris Johnson is willing to go through the extra mile, he has an absolute majority uh, in parliament and we are not afraid of going uh, for no deal. And this is completely switched in the last uh, three to four weeks, uh, going, uh, we are now willing to compromise, this is now the time to make a deal, uh, the Prime Minister and David Frost um, want a deal, 
deal um, and the deal is now for the taking uh, for the European Union. And I think this is a big discrepancy and the EU wants to stay very calm in that, has made very clear uh, we're sticking to our timeline and the real cutoff date for me for the deal is not this European Council today and tomorrow, it's in mid-November. Why is it in mid-November? Uh, because the European Parliament needs about a month, I think at minimum, to ratify a deal. It really ne needs a written text uh, to be analyzed and scrutinized as soon as possible. The last plenary of the European Parliament is just a week before Christmas. And so if you count back the steps that need to be taken to ratify the deal, uh, you had always came up uh, with a deadline around mid-November. And therefore, I think this European Council will be more about setting up the last crunch phase of the negotiations rather than the make or break point. And there will, as has always been throughout the negotiations, no direct talks between Boris Johnson and the other EU leaders, but rather the call between Boris Johnson and Ursula von der Leyen and Charles Michel yesterday. And then the EU leaders will come together today to discuss how to define their red lines, where they might be more willing to go a little bit towards the UK and where they expect the UK uh, to make more movement. Which brings me to my third point, what are the, the open issues and for me the dangerous points now, now in, in the negotiations. Um, and I don't want to elaborate on the different issues too long because that can be a whole another presentation and a whole, and whole other discussion because I think they're well known by now. Uh, their level playing field, uh, their fisheries, their state aid, and their governance and the dispute resolution mechanism. And throughout this whole year, I think uh, the negotiators on both sides made tremendous efforts on the techni technicalities, but the four major blocking points are still really the ones that are blocking in, in agreement and are the ones that need to be resolved on a political level in the next uh, two to four, four weeks. Um, and I think we've seen some movements here from the UK side, uh, but I, I have sort of apprehensions for where a deal could fall on, on three, three issues. Uh, the first is that the UK at least is briefing to its press that it has moved significantly um, on level playing field governance and state aid. So it presents the position of being open for compromise and having moved towards the Europeans. And this is not the way it's perceived here in Berlin or Brussels, uh, where it's very clear, yes, there was some movement, but this is far from enough uh, to satisfy the demands that the EU would have to give a country such with such close uh, economic links and geographic proximity to give it such a, a good access to the EU single market. And I think this gap on interpretation where we are is really a dangerous and could is really dangerous and could lead us to a Salzburg like moment in 2018 where the UK felt it has really moved and the UK and the EU really gave the thumbs down. Yeah. Yeah. Second is fisheries. Uh, the EU, uh, the UK believes the EU position on fisheries is not serious, uh, that this is the one area where the EU has refused to accept Brexit uh, and where it's really trying to put pressure for countries like Germany to split the EU 27 and say no France, uh, you have to compromise on fisheries and this will really be a ten, uh, contentious issue also between the EU 27, how far they will be willing to move on, uh, on that area. And thirdly, um, and I think I can come to a close here, uh, the UK from my point of view has really still underestimated the damage and trust the internal market bill has done on the EU side. And I think this has led the EU to double down and has become even stricter on its demand for governance. It wants now a dispute settlement uh, that works ex ante. So as soon as the UK breaches potentially its violation, the EU could step in. And the European Parliament, but I, I believe also Berlin and the other EU countries really want these contentious pieces of the internal market bill out before there is a deal uh, signed on, on, uh, on a free trade agreement. Uh, and that will be extremely difficult for the choreography between Brussels and Berlin to strike a point where both sides move at once and the UK internally is willing to take out these contentious measures to put in place in this sort of dance of Brexit negotiations a free trade agreement with compromises on both sides, more movement from the UK, but also some movement from the EU and in UK internal process uh, to, to resolve uh, that issue and regain trust. And I think this is possible. Uh, I'm 
of uh, the camp that still says we can go for a deal, but this is a very delicate choreography that needs to be done within a very, very short amount of time and the accidents could still very, uh, very much happen. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Nikolai. Thanks for giving us a bit of an outline, a bit of a look in the crystal ball, also what the choreography in the next um, coming weeks might look like. Before I turn to Tom for a, a bit of a detailed question, I have to feel I have to ask. Um, I just want to remind our viewers and listeners, participants, if they want to jump in our discussion, with their own questions, please feel free to do so. You have this little button at the bottom of your screen, Q&A. Use it, send me a question, and I'm going to ask it. Tom, I um, have been listening very carefully, of course, what all the three of you said, and I was, in a way, also intrigued by Nikolai. Of course, we all know the big issues which um, come up now and which have not been solved. Despite all the progress there has been on the fringes, we have the fish, we have the governance, and we have this question of the level playing field. Now, let me just zoom in on this for a very brief moment and, and help me from the viewpoint of British industry. Why shouldn't it be in the interest of your companies, the companies you are representing, that actually the EU gets in the end what it wants when, is it, when it comes to the level playing field? Why would it be so bad for companies in Britain um, if there is a dynamic alignment between the rules which are in the UK in the future and the rules which are um, EU? rules in the future. I mean, this seems to be um, one of the most, apart from state aid, one of the most contested um, issues for the next week. Why do you, why, why, why is Britain, apart from the, apart from the philosophical point of Brexit, leave that aside, from just on matter on the ground, what matters for business? Why is it such a big problem that the rules in a way stay the same? I would say perfect for business. Peter, it's a very good question. And, you know, I think you can look at this in a multiple uh, different ways. But in principle, I would agree with you. As I, I said earlier on, you know, uh, business by and large likes predictability. It likes stability. It likes large markets within which it can trade. It likes a single rule book. So, you know, I think all of that leads you to conclude that you, there, in many cases, um, would be a, a agreement with the point that you're making. I think that being said, you know, there were always exceptions to the rule. I remember uh, as we were running into the referendum and I was responsible for the British Chamber's task force on the UK referendum, the overwhelming majority of our members were in favour of the UK staying in the EU very clearly. But we had one or two who saw opportunity in in Brexit. And I think you have to keep in mind that business is about opportunity. Business will always adapt to changes and try to find, you know, where that gap in the market is. And I think you have to look at some of the future changes where maybe some of the business community look at where um, the EU perhaps has been less successful and where they think the economy may be going. So, for example, in advanced technologies, the transition to the digital economy, um, have we got the balance right on the EU side? Maybe that's something that people are looking at and saying, I'm not so sure. There's also a big discussion around science. You know, um, the EU has a very hazard-based approach to regulating things. Um, this is at odds with a lot of the development and innovation that is out there in many key parts of the economy. So, you know, there are areas where there may be some in the community that say, well, perhaps with that transition to the future, there may be more freedom and opportunity that comes from the UK going in its own direction. But I think by and large, the point that you make is, 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 is valid. And, you know, this is something where um, you see the business community started off by advocating for the UK to remain. And I think in large part, even within our membership, and again, I underline, we don't represent UK PLC. We have European countries, uh, companies, sorry, investing in the UK who are our members. You know, they're still advocating for 
as much of a deal as possible and as much cooperation and alignment as possible. This is clearly good for business. Thanks, Tom. Um, what I found interesting is, of course, that all three of you in your presentations used the word of rule of law and also have mentioned uh, um, internal market bill and the damage of trust as it, it, it kind of um, happened in um, the EU and also in, in Germany, as Nikolai pointed out. Let me ask you, Irina, um, of course, this, this feeling that the UK doesn't take the Northern Ireland provisions in the withdrawal agreement very seriously when it comes up with a bill which clearly contradicts what um, Boris Johnson has signed a couple of months ago. Um, the withdrawal agreement also includes, of course, the, reg the, the ideas, regulations and rules for EU citizens um, on on the British Isles after Brexit. And we, of course, have been reporting numerously um, about problems these citizens have with the Home Office, about getting um, their, 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 their right of residence um, confirmed and things like that. What is your take on that, Irina? Where do we stand on EU citizens' rights in the UK? On slippery ground, Peter, I'm afraid, is the short answer. And you're very right that this um, breach of trust has much wider applications, as I um, mentioned earlier. And by the way, I am one of those um, three million EU citizens in the UK, although I'm fortunate I now do have British citizenship, um, which I needed to represent Britain. But it, it is a precarious situation because the withdrawal agreement, one of the the core elements in the withdrawal agreement that was again and again debated also in Parliament when I was still part of it um, is protection of citizens' rights of those three million EU citizens in the UK and also reciprocally for UK citizens in the EU. Now, if we see that the government is willing to rip up um, the Northern Ireland Protocol, would it be willing to rip up some of these um, promises it, it has made EU citizens. So one issue at the moment is, is already one of interpretation, which is, yes, the government has promised settled status for citizens as a precondition to stay in the UK, but there is no written proof at the moment that you do have settled status. So how on earth would somebody returning from their home country to their residence in the UK be able to prove at the border that they actually have been granted this set of status? Are they supposed to look for an email from five years ago? Um, this is one of many topics that we are fighting for in a group called the Three Million, um, very big civil rights organization here in the UK. And one of the many issues that is troublesome and that has led already um, many UK uh, EU citizens rather to leave the UK. And let's not forget that thousands of them work in the National Health Service, for example, and that 4,000 or so have already left as a consequence of these uncertainties. And that leaves the UK also in a very vulnerable position. Irina, let me stay with you um, because um, Ricardo from Lisbon has sent us a question which I think um, you could answer quite well because you already alluded to it in your introductory remarks when you said um, the union, our union, meaning of okay, the UK and the United, the United Kingdom. Ricardo asks how much this Brexit process actually might lead to some kind of breakup of this union across the channel in the long time. Of course, we all know the Scottish independent movement, which has been there a long time, but there has also been, of course, not in the headlines, but in the small print, the suspicion that the EU actually could want or work for some kind of Irish reunification. I, I'm not saying this is true. I'm just saying that it was a bit of a talk around. What's your assessment? How dangerous for the integrity of the United Kingdom is this process we are in? Well, I think, again, it, it is very precarious, um, particularly with regard to Scotland, as I mentioned earlier. So the, the, the situation has really shifted from the first Scottish independence referendum we had um, a number of years ago, because now there is an additional incentive for those people who would rather be member of the bigger club, which is the EU, than 
the smaller club, which is the United Kingdom, with all its problems at the moment, economic problems. A lot of this, of course, will depend on the stance of the EU and how willing the EU would be, particularly Spain, of course, which has its own secessionist problem, um, to allow an independent Scotland to rejoin, because, of course, that is the promise that is made, if not explicitly, then certainly implicit, by the Scottish National Party. And if they can make it credible that Scotland can somehow, on its own, rejoin the European Union uh, sooner rather than later, that may drive a lot of people who did not really want to have an independent Scotland, but are desperate to be and remain members um, or to rejoin the European Union to eventually vote for independence. So I think it is a distinct possibility that Scotland may leave. An independence referendum would require the um, consent of the government in Westminster. So if Boris Johnson refuses such a referendum, we are indeed in a sort of Catalonia type situation of a standoff. And again, that can lead to considerable political instability. Political instability in Ireland is on a much greater scale because I think any attempt for Northern Ireland to um, move towards some form of closer alignment with the Republic is going to risk um, a re-eruption of the violence that we have seen um, so sadly um, throughout the years of the so-called troubles. And therefore, this is an even more difficult situation in Northern Ireland. Nikolai, you mentioned um, in your presentation the, the way the, the appearance of the, of the UK negotiation position might have shifted from actually bullying the Europeans also with this internal market bill, threatening them, we can walk away to some kind of more um, compromising stance in the last couple of weeks. Where do you think does this come from? Does Boris Johnson now really want a deal? And please walk us, not maybe through the next weeks, but just through the next days, if you, if you don't mind. So we have a European Council today where we will have press conferences tonight and um, by Chancellor Merkel probably tomorrow. And everybody will say, um, our door is open. We want a deal, but not for every price. They will repeat what you said on the big issues which are still out there and which partly we have discussed. How will Boris Johnson react on Monday? Uh, good, good question, the crystal ball. Um, I think the, how you can explain the British attitude is, that the core analysis of Brexiteers in London, whether it's right or wrong, has been that from their perspective, Theresa May got such a bad outcome for Britain on the withdrawal agreement because she was never able or willing to credibly threaten with no deal. And uh, that the UK um, is in a weaker position in these negotiations and therefore has to play all its cards as aggressively as possible um, in these negotiations uh, to, to get to a deal. And therefore, in 2019, even though we all knew that Boris Johnson could be stopped by Parliament, he did everything uh, to, to show that he was willing to go for no deal. And the same thing for me happened over the summer with the UK saying we're not going to extend transition uh, going out with all the briefings uh, that Boris Johnson is willing to go for no deal. And there's a tremendous, uh, if I can say so, message discipline uh, of the UK government, uh, pushing out these messages publicly, but also to the press and over think tank events. Um, and so I think it was a very deliberate messaging to show to the EU, we are willing to do that. Um, and then in addition, you have to think about that the people around Boris Johnson came into power because they break all the political conventions in, in the UK. Um, and they've been successful with that. Uh, they have now the absolute majority in the UK. They've turned around the political system in the UK. Uh, and this is their approach also to, the, to these negotiations. So I think we shouldn't be surprised uh, that this mantra of we need to threaten with no deal to get a deal uh, is very much alive. What we don't know, uh, let, it me, let me phrase it like that. I think besides all the threats, we know that Boris Johnson wants a deal. 
but we don't know how much he is willing to sacrifice for getting a deal and whether he is willing to confront the hardliners within his party to get there. Um, and so I think the, the, the options that we have for, for these next uh, two to three weeks is the positive case is the European Council today says um, the situation is serious, uh, but we need to intensify the negotiations behind closed doors. They talk about possible compromises. Negotiators go into what they call a tunnel of really deep negotiations over the next two to three weeks. Uh, work out a compromise that both sides then come out together to the publics in the first two, two weeks of November. The negative case is um, the EU doubles down over this European Council, even makes its red lines more harder, for instance, on fish, uh, where the countries uh, with a strong interest on that say we cannot compromise on that, we need the UK to move forward the two sides come into a contest where both accuse each other of breaking their, their promises um, and negotiations continue, but we don't get to a resolution until mid-November, time, time runs out, and sometime until before Christmas, either side says we're not getting a deal uh, before, before uh, November. But I think it really depends on how, what the signals the European Council sends out and whether the UK accepts uh, that from an EU position, it hasn't moved as much as the UK requires for a deal. And really, as I said in my earlier introduction, they are able to get this choreography right of jumping together and then also getting, getting uh, the right signals on the internal market. Uh, but it will be extremely difficult. Uh, but I think for now, the interpretation from the EU side is that a lot of what the EU, UK has done is negotiation tactics uh, rather than the willingness to completely blow up these negotiations and provoke a no deal scenario. Thanks very much, Nicolai. We are almost running out of time. And um, of course, Brexit is um, a topic we I really would love to um, continue discussing for the next couple of, um, I don't know, for at least another half an hour or hour because it's so multifaceted. And um, I like also the crystal ball, ball approach for the next month. But I, I know it's also, like Daniel said in his introductory remarks, also a sad topic because there's somebody leaving or somebody has been leaving and it's kind of a separation. But Irene, Irina, maybe um, the Lib Dems in, in the UK are able to give us some kind of at least slightly more positive um, takeaway at the end of our conversation. I think in your party convention there has also been talk about if there's any chance that eventually fast forward in the long term future there might be a chance or a situation when the UK might rejoin the European Union. So um, help us with that. Is there any realistic um, scenario behind that? I will try to help you with that. Yes, I mean, Brexit for me personally is, is a very sad topic because I stood on the platform um, about a year and a half ago to stop Brexit. And obviously I failed um, to do that. And our party has always been fighting tooth and nail against Brexit, as I'm sure you're aware. Now, Brexit um, is now irreversible, but of course, time moves on. And we had indeed a very long debate about the longer term future. And I, for once, left my office in Brussels uh, on the 31st of January with a promise to myself that I wanted to return as a UK MEP one day, even if they have to wheel me in in a wheelchair. Um, but I'm also realistic. We are not going to be able to rejoin within the next five or even 10 years, partly because of the issues we mentioned. There has been a significant erosion of trust and it will take a long time to rebuild that trust. There is no doubt about it. And it also takes two to tango. And we mustn't forget that there are other um, countries that are waiting desperately and patiently to join the EU. Um, we would also potentially lose some of the privileges that we've had, some of the exemptions um, in the past. So conditions for rejoining may be much harsher than they were when we were a member. But I am still optimistic that one day we will rejoin. 
And this is because I know that public opinion in the UK has shifted. Every single poll that has been conducted since the 31st of January indicated that now there is a clear majority of people who regret Brexit. And arguably more people voted for parties in December last year, voted for parties who were against Brexit than voted for parties in favour. And it was only because of our electoral system that um, the Tories still got a majority. So I would say in the long run, yes, we will rejoin, but it is a long path that needs to be paved first. Tom, last word um, to the industry, to business, which is kind of unusual, but still I want to <laughs> get your point of view on this. Is there any thinking about this in uh, the British um, community, business community, or is this just too long term and too unrealistic and one has to work what's, with what's happening now and prepare for um, the worst maybe? I think, quite honestly, Peter, from a pure business perspective, it is too long term. Yeah. You know, we, we're facing, you know, we're looking down the barrel of a gun. And right now what we want <laughs> is a deal, hopefully a deal with an implementation period in it, which gives us a little bit more comfort and room to sort out what, as I said, is going to be a very messy 1st of January, whether we have a deal or not. But I would echo what Irina said. I think, you know, we are... Uh, uh, nations and entities that are, have a history and a proximity together, which means that at some point in time we have to come back together. But we have to build trust and confidence. And I think the business community has a huge role to play in that. And I hope that we can continue dialogues like this because I think the business community wants to contribute and has important things to, to offer and to say. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot to all the three of you. So that will be interesting how the next weeks turn out. And um, we looked in the crystal ball and um, yeah, let's see how things develop. Um, with this open remark, I would turn it over to the European Liberal Forum once more. I think um, Andre has um, listened in closely and wants maybe to wrap up our discussion. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you, everybody, everybody for tuning in, for participating here on Zoom and uh, on social media as well. A big thank you to our speakers for sharing their very interesting viewpoints from, I'm going to take it from west to east, uh, London, Brussels and Berlin. Uh, and going with the weather as well. I can only I can only echo what uh, all of you have said that uh, indeed it is a sad process for 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 people, for businesses, for uh, for future generations as well. But I think that we all have this uh, this hidden hope that at some point things will change and will become one big happy family again in the future. Um, I know we're going a bit over time, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna wrap it up. That there, there, there is always a glimmer of hope, I think. And let's see what the next uh, couple of weeks and couple of months unfold here in Brussels and in London as well, and in other capitals uh, around Europe. Um, hopefully, we'll uh, we'll we'll start the first of January with a mutually beneficial uh, relationship for everybody. On both sides of the on both sides of the channel, and uh, we hope that we're just going to be able to to build from there in a in a liberal mindset and in a liberal spirit. And with that, on that note, I just want to thank everybody again. Uh, direct you very nicely to the European Liberal Forum website, where we will have this recording this afternoon. So if you missed anything or if you want to rewatch it, then go there, have a look. Also check out our other events. We have a lot of them coming up. We have a lot of very good publications coming up. Daniel also mentioned some of them as well. And our next on the agenda uh, webinar will focus on EU-Russia relations. And it's gonna take place uh, same time, same place in two weeks from now on 29th of October. So stay tuned for that. We'll put on more information on our website. Thank you again. I wish you a very good and productive day wherever you are, uh, in whatever capital or whatever country you are. And I hope to see you soon at another European Liberal Forum event. Thank you and goodbye.
Thank you.